How's it going, everyone? My name is Michael SK, and welcome back to Chaos Head Noah. I think we ended the previous episode off with uh, with Takumi getting his ass kicked. I want to say that's where we were, but I could be really wrong. Uh, yeah, he's kind of he's kind of losing his mind, or at least people think he is with the whole. Oh, he's a psychic, and oh no, he's actually just doing it for attention, of which we were baited into doing. Uh, there's there's a lot of confusing stuff going on, to be completely honest. It's really hard to do these recaps because there's just so much I don't know, and I don't really know what's happening and all of that. But my shoulder was shaken softly. It was an extremely gentle, or it was extremely gentle, and after just one shake, it stopped. <laughs> It felt like someone was peering at my face. My consciousness was slowly returning to me. As it did, the pain in my body returned along with it. The smell in my nose, it was a smell so strong it made me want to vomit, the smell of blood. <coughs> I felt a tingling around my upper lip. The taste of iron spread through my mouth. Iron or iron? I kind of went with the iron choice, but I, I say iron. What do you guys say? Slowly, I open my eyes. Ah. Okay, that's right. I'm, I'm sort of remembering where we were. I have an idea of where things are going. I'm not going to say anything, though. <clears throat> I was in the same back alley as before. I was lying face down on the asphalt, and right in front of me was a small reddish-brown puddle of liquid, likely seeping out from one of the dumpsters. Grimacing at the smell invading my nostrils, I sat up. My whole body ached. My face in particular hurt like hell. <clears throat> like hell, excuse me. Uh, it was hot and tingly, like someone had taken a lighter and gasoline to it. <laughs> right beside me, a girl I recognized was kneeling down and looking at me. She looked like she was about to cry. It was the transfer student, the girl who transferred into my class. Uh, what was her name again? Aura... Ohara? Oshihara? Why was the transfer student here, I wondered. <laughs> and then the transfer student held out something to me. It was my wallet. Why did she have it? My head still foggy, I looked around. <gasps> the three dokuns that had attacked me earlier were now lying in a pool of blood. W what the hell? It was like they'd all been one-shot by some OP mob. The faces of all three were barely still intact. Were they dead? None of them moved a single muscle. No, was this the seventh new gen case? Who the hell would do something like this? Had... had I... <laughs> the transfer student then stood up and beckoned to me. I was completely pale. She alternated between looking at me, who was still very confused, and the three collapsed people. Tears welled up in the corner of her eyes. Suddenly, she grabbed my hand and took off running, with me in tow, staggering every once in a while. What an interesting sight that must be. As soon as we reached the main street, the transfer student let go of my hand, and we hadn't run very far, but she was already out of breath. I mean, she was like... She's like half our size, right? She's pretty small in stature, and she's tugging along, you know, us. <clears throat> we both fell silent. Maybe the transfer student was just as bad at talking as I was. No, that didn't matter right now. What I needed to do first was figure out what the hell happened. It, I had been, or I had been, I'd been being harassed. What? I was being harassed, let's go with that, that reads way better, by those dokuns, and then they picked a fight with me. Then I must have passed out, but how long had I been unconscious? Wait, are we going into our memories, or are we... Are we coming up with a delusion? What? Oh, nope, it's delusion time. Why did that oh, anime... Oh. What? Huh? <laughs> Oh, okay. No, 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 no. No, this is right. This is right. There it was again. I'd heard it again. I thought someone I knew was nearby and was trying to talk to me, but I couldn't see anyone that fit that description. Damn it. Where were all these auditory illusions coming from? Why were they all happening today? Oh, uh, yeah. I know. I didn't choose anything there. 
I didn't know if it was going to actually send us into, like, a delusion of our own. And I actually wanted this to kind of play out. Maybe I've gotten so overwhelmed lately, I had to create a new personality inside my head just so I could cope with everything. Or is you a right? And I really do have multiple personalities. I've heard that people with multiple personalities can't have conversations between personalities, but maybe this is an exception. I was getting really fed up with this voice. I wonder how I'm going to be able to stand just this annoying uh, Kozupi personality, let alone all the other ones. Besides, how many personalities do I have inside me in the first place? I read in some books somewhere that there are patients in the US with as many as 24 personalities. Honestly, I never really looked at, like, I never looked into it. I never looked up real cases, but I probably should now that I've come across, like, a few instances of it in, like, books and visual novels even. And on top of that, actually, maybe even some anime too. I'm not even sure if the personality I know is me, or as me, is the real one, the main one. Maybe the original personality that owns Nishijo Takumi's body isn't actually me. As I stood there frozen and dumbfounded, the transfer student poked my shoulder with her finger. When she poked me, she tried to mumble something, but hadn't ended up saying anything. So instead of speaking, she decided to timidly raise her hand. Oh, okay, so that's her nickname. Uh, yeah, I think you guys could probably get what's going on here, because I, I know that I do. <laughs> unfortunately. Orihara Kozoe. I very faintly remembered hearing that name from Misumi-kun a long time ago. Kozoe, Kozoe, Kozu P. No. Does this mean that this voice I'm hearing is one that you're sending to my head? The transfer student nodded her head emphatically. That's ridiculous. This voice is her. The transfer student, her head still hanging downward, glanced up at me and pointed at my face. Her fingertip was trembling. I touched my hand to my face. The bottom of my nose was slimy. My nose was bleeding. The transfer student offered me a tissue. I took it from her and wiped away the blood, and I was still feeling very nauseous. The transfer student is... Kozupi isn't moving her mouth. She isn't talking, so why can I hear her voice? Enough of that obnoxious speaking style. I can't stand it when people do that IRL. Wait, you can hear my inner voice too? Ah, yeah. So, so because it's embarrassing to talk out loud, yeah, uh, this, this is a good alternative. Fantastic. Oh, I know how you feel. I'm like that, too. When I said that, she scurried around me like a chipmunk, glanced at me, and then started walking toward the station by herself. Why? Well, confused, I followed her. As I walked, I noticed something. There was a stabbing pain in my side. The pain throbbed with every step I took, so I, f I was forced to stop. I gripped my side and took a breath. There were people everywhere. I hated Shibuya with a burning passion. I felt like everyone I passed by was laughing at me. I felt like everyone was watching me. I felt like everyone knew my face. Don't look at me. Don't laugh at me. I want to find somewhere I can get away from it all. I need a place to rest.
The energy in Kozupi's voice now is a stark contrast to the few times we saw each other at school before. And even though she doesn't talk IRL, her inner voice has, a uh, energy to spare, to say the least. <laughs> Being able to talk to her in my head is convenient, but at the same time, it's kind of annoying. This is the only way I can talk to an anime babe. Come to think of it, I'm accepting this stuff pretty easily, despite the fact that I'm not sure how the hell it actually works. Is this really a genuine, real-life psychic power? Yes, slightly. I'm not bothered by the fact that you're not normal, it's just that I've met all kinds of weirdos recently. But you, Kozupi, you talk kind of funny, sure, but you're not scary, and you're not Denpatir. If anything, I prefer this. As we walked, Kozupi suddenly burst into tears. Startled, I hurriedly gave her back the tissue. After bl er, bowing to me way more times than she needed to, she took the tissue and wiped the tears from her eyes. Back to what I was saying earlier. It feels really weird and also makes me feel pretty uncomfortable when people can hear everything I'm thinking. And that's my honest opinion about it. She kind of reminds me of uh, when I played Grisaya all those years ago. The way that Makina would actually talk in that one was so fucking annoying. Like, sure, the text was read to annoy you and trying to mimic however the hell she's trying to talk in Japanese, but just also that, that cutesy way that they talk in, just, it like grinds, like, I guess my gears, one could say. Is that so? Well, either way, I know you don't want to be told that by an otaku freak like me. I was right. A disgusting like er, a, dis a disgusting guy like me, words, really is worthless. <laughs> Just as I was about to revert to my depressed state, Kozuki shouted at me with her inner voice. Tears started to trickle down her face once again. Why are you crying? Do you feel sorry for me? If so, there's no reason to. I mean, look at me. I'm so utterly delusional, I create personalities inside my head and treat them like they're actually real people. For example, there's Remy. You know her. Uh, no, not really. Like hell she is. Because if he knows who Remy is, which means Remy is real. She isn't just a delusion. She isn't someone I made up in my head. Remy really is real. So oh, God. Yeah, but whatever her involvement is here in the story is becoming a little suspicious. I mean, there was good reason to be suspicious of her from the get-go. I mean, come on, it's a little obvious that she kind of popped up and, like, inserted herself into the world somehow. Like, that, that, that has to be obvious, right? And we also saw her at that, uh, at the, whatever the fuck it is, the staking, yeah, that. We saw her in that incident. She was there. It's like she was actually doing it. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of weird shit going on surrounding her. I don't trust her, but I need to know what she's up to. We need to see more of her. We need more interactions with her. I'm so happy. I don't think we should be trusting her whatsoever here, but here we are. But if that's really true, then why hasn't she contacted me a single time? Maybe the O-Front incident really did make her fall out of love with- out of love with me, excuse me. 
地震があったあの日青い顔をして早退して行っちゃったならそれ以来学校来てないよ OK that's good information もしかして家族に何か悲しいことがあったかも Is that so? I felt like I'd been saved. Now that I knew that Rumi hadn't abandoned me, I genuinely felt like I was about to burst into tears. If it's really true, if Rumi really isn't a delusion, then I actually have a reason to go to school, to see Rumi again. So until I see her once again, I'll try my hardest to. Huh? Yeah, we do. What do you mean? Again, what do you mean? What do you mean I don't really know her? What, what do you mean because of the, the crucifixion? I'm going to call it that. I don't know. I don't know why they called it that specifically. I know that I know that they have their reasoning for renaming a whole bunch of the events, but it's like, damn, at least make it easy to fucking like, you know, speak or, or something. Or is it that even though I'm supposed to have been、uh, classmates with her since first year, all my memories of her are missing? It's true that Rumi still is a bit of a mystery to me, but she saved me over and over again. Whenever I'm scared, she tells me that she'll stay by my side. She's not my enemy. Unless she is. For some reason, Kozuki looked a bit unstable. Sorry. This is just pretty new to me. Whenever I have a conversation with someone, I always end up not being able to say even 20% of what I'm thinking before it ends. But when it comes to this mental stuff, I guess I just can't help but talk too much. Because I think too much. And I guess that kind of applies to you too. I never would have expected you to talk so much inside your head, that is. In Japanese, please. I can kind of understand what you're going for, though. I think you're trying to say that you don't have the real subtlety or nuance of actual conversation. There's nothing like, for example, looking at the other person's expression and then deciding that you're no longer able to bring yourself to say what you wanted to say because of it. If people's thoughts just leaked out wildly, then you'd no longer be able to read the room. The transmission isn't one way, but it isn't two way either. It's like having to pick one arrow out of an avalanche of other arrows, all of which were flying in different directions, all while somehow ignoring all the other ones you didn't need. You have to tune out the excess noise. That's right. For a moment, Kozuki's expression clouded a bit, but not long after, a tearful smile arose to her face. Beep, beep, beeps. Are you trying to say that we're on the same wavelength? Well, I guess it's probably because I do something similar with Saraton pretty often. Back then? Oh god, that reminds me. I think I had a really stupid delusion this morning. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I 
Wait, you don't understand. Back then, I was just really desperate, and, uh... Uh, well, at the end of the day, it was just a delusion. <laughs> Who am I kidding? You probably hate me. Wait, what? Hold on. Let me read that again. Uh, if Nishijo-kun really did do that, and then we would have killed him right then and there. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. If we really felt that way, he would have been dead. Straight up. She'd said such a disturbing thing so innocently. The contrast between the two extremes sent a chill down my spine. I guess I'll state this now, since uh, we are kind of in the middle of this lovely long-ass conversation with her. So, I knew this was coming up at some point. Like, I, I remember this. I, I don't remember when it came back to me, but yeah, this character uh, with uh, the ability to talk with only her brain because for some reason she can't talk. And I guess the excuse here is that she is just too scary. She can't do it. Oh well. Uh, I don't know what the anime's excuse was. I remember being told uh, that she just couldn't talk for whatever reason. And this is her ability. And uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of annoying. I think the anime made it more annoying than it's actually coming off as here. Maybe because we're actually taking the time to get to, you know, know her. Instead of it just kind of being shoved upon us for the sake of uh, trying to follow the plot in the anime. By the way, don't ever watch the anime. I don't know if I've ever brought that specifically up, but just pretend the anime doesn't exist. There is no anime adaptation of Chaos Head. Remaining silent while still communicating in our heads, the two of us passed through Center Guy and came out on Inukashira Dori. From an outsider's perspective, do the two of us look like a brand new couple walking in silence without even looking at each other? <laughs> Kozupi let out a crazy loud gasp next to me. Her eyes went wide and she looked up at me. <laughs> no, it was just a random thought. A random thought. Sorry. I knew it. It really does suck trying to think when someone's listening to every thought you have. Whenever I was talking to Kozupi, it would probably be better for my overall health if I avoided any unnecessary delusions as much as possible. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Jesus Christ. Down below? Yeah, those are things that we were thinking and probably saying out loud. Did my inner voice really reach that far? It's a surprisingly long way from the roof of Ofron to the ticket gate at the station. Huh, I guess Kozupi really did understand. I didn't cause such an uproar because I was planning to show off my ESP. But in the end, it was all pointless. I put my own life before Nanami's, and at the very last second, I escaped. Because if he stopped before the entrance to Roft, and then, while pointing at the entrance, she looked at me. This must have been where she wanted to take me. I didn't think there would be a place to rest inside Roft. It was a small cramped spot that was filled to the brim with customers. My legs were unconsciously shaking. The cheers and shouts I'd heard that night at Scramble Crossing resounded inside my head. I don't want to go to places with lots of people. 
Once I go inside there, there'll be nowhere to run. I'm gonna get sent to another realm or something when we enter. In spite of how afraid I was, Kusapi marched on ahead, ignoring me. I had no choice but to follow her as fast as my legs could take me, trying my best not to look at my surroundings. Oh no, we have to pass through the perfume department. As we got on the escalator, Kusapi looked back at me standing behind her. She was standing one step higher than me, putting us at about equal height. Did we really do anything though? My power isn't what saved her. I might as well have done nothing at all. No, I was trying to get the sword. It was a delusional sword and it blended right in with the scenery I saw from the rooftop. Mm-hmm. A D-sword. I was told that I could reach out and grab it, but I couldn't. Hmm. I shouted that aloud without thinking. I mean, it's not really surprising to me. Again, anime. A couple passing by on the escalator gave me an irritated look, and I frantically slapped my hand over my mouth. Kuzupi, how do you know what a D-sword is? <laughs> as soon as we got off the escalator on the fifth floor, Kazui casually raised her right hand above her head. It was like she was trying to shade herself from the radiant glare of the sun using her hand. As if it were running or yeah, as if it were running along her hand, light suddenly appeared in the air. No, it wasn't light. It was closer to lines. If I were to describe it, it'd be similar to wireframe. Countless rays of light intersected in the seemingly en in the seemingly empty space, excuse me, before eventually forming a shape akin to that of a snowboard. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I heard these words fucking weird if I remember correctly. And then several streaks of blue light, more fiercely brilliant than any of the wireframe lines, ran across the entirety of it. Kozupi then clasped her own hand. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a little funky look. Oh, it's not as bad as I thought it would actually be. It's, it's not terrible, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. How do I turn off the... Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's not bad. It's just ridiculous in size and shape for her. Immediately following this, what had originally been wireframe, appearing as though a texture had been applied to it transformed into a massive, solid, seemingly cold-to-the-touch metal plank. Oh, we can do a delusion. Oh, we're not supposed to be doing these here, though. Not a good idea. Not for her. I'll, I'll skip this. The shape was far too different than the one Senna and ISA possessed, and yet, even so, the aura about its body was the exact same. It was too sinister to be called a board. It was too unaffected to be called a sword. It possessed a pure, unadulterated savagery, one which intermingled with its destructive nobility. She held it in the air with incredible ease. Yeah, let's just, uh, we're going for the delusionless, uh, I guess, session, if you will. It was way too big to be swung around like that indoors. Oh, you know what? That's that's why it looks weird. It's the way she holds it. Again, it's just it's so fucking large in every way. It's a, it's kind of just uncanny, I guess. There were other customers around. If anyone were to get hurt, it'd be a total disaster. Kozapi's behavior was making me real nervous. I wasn't sure if it was because she knew I was afraid, but uh, Kozapi recklessly lowered her sword and spun around on the spot. She looked like she was having fun. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, she uh, she beat up those bad guys, you know, as they were beating us up. Beat up and down the baddies. Those words made me feel uneasy. Something bothered me about them. And what I remembered was the smell, the smell of blood. 
I remembered the scene of the Dokuns lying down in a pool of blood. You know, her attempt of a cute facade here aside, if you even want to call it a facade, yeah, let, let's not forget that she actually did beat the complete shit out of those three goons by herself with this big-ass blade. So they really were dead. Kaki Rochis? Alrighty then. I could feel pretty clearly where Kozapi's mind was when she'd said that. There was not a trace of malice within her. She just wanted to take revenge on the bad people who had wronged her. And I didn't think there was anything inherently wrong with that. I think there's more going on than we think. This girl honestly seems pretty twisted, albeit in a different way than me. Yeah, we, we don't even know where we're going yet, we're just in this store. Kozapi began to walk, her gigantic D-sword still in hand. She was pretty short and her arms were really thin. She didn't look like she could even lift a feather and yet despite all these things, she didn't show any signs of her sword weighing her down. In fact, her steps were light and springy. I covered my eyes again and again each time the tip of the sword nearly collided with passing customers. Oh, excuse me, or products on display. Miraculously, though, it didn't end up hitting anything. I think it's because it's still, like, in a delusional state. It hasn't been rebooted, I think is the term. So it's not physically interacting with shit. We then arrived at a staircase. It was dimly lit, and unlike the rest of the floor, there was no sign of anyone around. No one even approached the area. I didn't expect to find such a desolate spot inside Roft, a ridiculously popular store, especially since it was only a five minute walk from Shibuya Station. You only moved here a few weeks ago and I've been living here for almost two years. How exactly did you know about this but I didn't? Plus, uh, Takumi does stay at home, like, all the time, so there's also that. Kozupi, seemingly in a good mood, sat down on the steps. She then casually laid her D-sword down on the floor. I had a pain in my side that was becoming unbearable, so I decided to take a break as well for the time being. What in the world are you talking about? Yeah, I'm lost. I don't know how that happened. Oh, you mean that? Yeah, I've experienced that before. When I was looking from the perspective of the O-front rooftop, I saw something. I saw a D-sword blending into the scenery. Ham pom pom? How did you actually get your hands on it? In the end, I found my sword, but I couldn't take it. No matter how hard I tried to reach for it, I couldn't grab hold of it. 
you wish for it. Like, what, that you could have it? But if that's what you did, then I did the same thing. Stopping my thoughts in its or my thought in its tracks, Kusumi looked up at me and shook her head faintly. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> God damn this fucking character. She is a mixed bag of I don't even know what the fuck. Her inner voice echoed clearly in my head. I hadn't misheard her. She'd said it very very clearly. Yeah, she did. Kozepi wished to kill, and she'd been beaming as she said it. The stairs leading up from the fifth floor to the sixth were very quiet, with only the faintest background music leaking in from the restaurant. Neither one of us said a word. The sound of someone breathing entered my ears. Was it hers? No, it was my own. A staircase where no one would ever approach. A blind spot in the heart of Shibuya, a pocket of air. I swallowed back my saliva in an attempt to wet my increasingly dry throat. And then what happened? What did you do after that? Hmm, interesting. But you also tried to kill people with it. Cool. This girl. It's like she's broken. The way she gazed lovingly at the sword resting beside her, I could tell that she had absolute faith in it, something her heart told me as well. Would I have to become this broken in order to get my hands on a D-sword? Was I still not broken in to begin with? I think the problem is that we need to actually see it as a weapon and not just a sword, if that makes any sense. Hey, yo, she's actually talking fucking normally. That was what Orihara Kozue had thought before she came to Tokyo. But now it was different. Now it had become something very important. Something entirely irreplaceable to her. This sword. If I have it, then I won't be afraid. This sword will protect me. This sword is my heart, another me. It had been about three weeks ago when she had first begun to think so. Ever since she was a child, Kozue had the ability to hear the inner voices present in other people's heads. As to when she had first become aware of it, she could no longer remember. I must be crazy, I must be really sick. They thought, these thoughts uh, pervaded her mind as she sought to understand. Even though she was very young at the time, Kozue knew that her power was something no one could know about. Thus, she concealed it from her parents. Her powers rendered her unable to make friends, forged a rift between her and her family, and made, the, and made the people around her think that she was merely a girl with ridiculous intuition, one that gave them the creeps. Even when she came to Shibuya, she had still been afraid to go to school. She did not want to meet anyone new nor talk to anyone. She thought that they would just be creeped out by her no matter what she did. She did not go to school on the day she was first supposed to, nor the next day or even the day after that, instead choosing to wander about Shibuya during the morning. There was no doubt that Kozue's parents had been notified by the school as the staff must have noticed that Kozue had been absent without prior notice, and yet her parents had said nothing to her. It would be understandable for people to mistake her for a middle school student, but unlike the countryside where she had, uh, where she had used to reside, there was no one around to rebuke her as such when she walked the streets on weekday mornings. It had been several days since she had first begun wandering around Shibuya. In that time, she had found a place to relax. The stairs within the local raft. It had become routine for her to sit there and stare off into space. This routine remained true on that day as well, and after spending nearly four hours there, evening broke, 
and she left Roth to return home. Raindrops fell from the dark gray sky. Kozue didn't have an umbrella, and yet without looking up at the sky, nor once fretting about getting wet, she timidly stepped out onto the rain. Out into the rain. And at that very moment, something entered her field of view. That's, that's not a something, that's a someone. The world is ending. A sign with that message written upon it, sodden by the rain, the handwriting had blurred. The person holding the sign was a lone, lifeless, homeless man sitting on the side of the road under the pouring rain. His head hung downward so that no one could see his face. Perhaps he was dead. That person, seeing him as though it were a mirror image of herself sitting on the stairs, Kozue ceased her stride. <laughs> For just a moment, she hesitated. He was a stranger, a homeless man that she had never seen before coming to Tokyo. Just the mere sight of him brought a feeling of revulsion. If I talk to him, what if something terrible happens to me? Such anxieties pervaded Kozue's mind. But what was far stronger than that anxiety was Kozue's strong urge to kill the man. It was an all-too-sudden impulse, one that struck Kozue with the feeling that, if she went through with it, she would be killing herself as well. And so, after hesitating for one moment longer, Kozue sent the man the voice of her heart. The man's shoulders twitched. He was not dead. Slowly, he raised his head. His cloudy eyes, peeking out from between sodden bangs, looked up at Kozue. Ah, oh, okay, so they're, they're just speaking like this now. Kozue's eyes widened slightly in surprise. Not at the fact that he had just confirmed the world was ending, but that the man had replied at all. She had not been expecting a reply. The person to whom she would send her inner voice to would rarely respond well. Instead, they would face immense confusion, write it off as an auditory illusion, or shudder in terror before walking away with a hurried pace. Even if she did succeed in communicating with them, it was difficult for the other party to send back a reply in an orderly manner. People's thoughts were far too chaotic and disorderly. And yet, the man's expression did not change. He had simply answered Kozue's question with an incredibly short response. The heart Kozue felt from the man's voice was laden with a deep sadness. To her, it almost felt as if his heart was shedding tears. Kozue raised her hands above her head and withdrew her sword where she stood. She thrust the end of the blade toward the man. Okay. Hmm. おじさんのせいなの中国しかできないから動き出してしまったからもうおじさんには止めるすべがないからじゃあおじさんを殺せば小ズピーは悪くなくなるのその件は君を殺す者にも守る者にもなる思い出してごらん空を見れば雲が川を見れば流れがそこにあったはずそれと同じことその剣はいつも君のそばにあった自分自身の心を見てごらんそこにあるのがその剣なんだよでも
あらゆるものを殺すためのものじゃないの負の感情は否定されるものじゃない人が誰しも持つものだからね特別じゃないんだどう向き合うかだよ目をそらしてはいけない自分を否定してはいけない世界は共造君の心の中にある性は同時にふとなりうるしその逆もまた可能世界が終わるのか生き続けるのかそれを選べるのは君たちだけなんだ This is some kingdom heart shit going on here. In the end, Kuzue had not killed the man. The urge had, for some reason or another, ceased to be as the man spoke to her. She did not expressly understand the meaning of the man's words, but even still, she thought long and hard before eventually arriving at a single conclusion. This sword is me. If I look at it and don't deny it, it'll save me. And for that reason, Kuzue fully cast her faith in the sword, or her sword. Okay. Interesting. And, and that is a story that was just given to us. Fantastic. All right. Well, maybe that'll give us a hint as to how to obtain our own sword or something like that. I don't know. We're seven chapters in. We're about to be in the eighth one, I feel. And Takumi is yet to have a fucking D sword. Ugh. When, when is it going to get good? Well, actually, I don't know. It's always been good. It's just been. It's been super confusing, and I guess that's the good in this, in a way. I don't know. I guess as long as he doesn't have a sword, it will continue to be a mystery in a lot of regards, and once he does get the sword, maybe we'll begin to clear some shit up. I really don't know. I don't, I have no idea. But uh, yeah, this was a good episode. Thank you all for watching. And I think my uh, opinion of this character has changed slightly. I always saw her as ridiculously annoying. But that was because of the anime, and the anime doesn't exist. So maybe she isn't too terrible. She's got a really weird side to her, but it's not bad. It's not bad at all. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that fancy jazz, and I will see you all in the next one. Take it easy.